So you're live, Megan hey, and Tom. Hey, great. Welcome, everyone. We are standing in front of a, a pig pasture that's been used for farrowing since 1936. We're broadcasting live from sunny Northeast Iowa in between Alta Vista and New Hampton. And I'm here with Tom Franson, who has decades of experience in raising livestock and specifically pigs and pasture farrowing. So Tom is an organic livestock and crop farmer. And he is going to tell us a bit of history around all of the iterations of pasture farrowing that he has done throughout his decades of experience. So in a bit, we're going to get a little history lesson from Tom and look at the different construction builds for each type of farrowing house that he has used in the past, and then end up looking at his latest iteration, which he built over the winter, these new boxes, which he's calling practical farrowing boxes. And he'll explain all about the practicality in a bit. So firstly, I wanted to say thank you for all of you viewing out there. Sorry about our technical difficulties. If you are still having trouble accessing the chat or anything, you may need to log into YouTube via your Google account or create an actual YouTube channel to be able to access the chat and ask questions. So please ask all the questions you want. I'm watching the chat, so I'll relay those questions to Tom during our discussion. Also, I'd like to say I'm Megan Filbert. I am joined here at the farm with other PFI staff, Nick Odie, Brennan and Emma, where and Jason and Megan Sweeney are back at headquarters in Ames at the PFI office, manning the computers from there. So with that, Tom, I would love for you to give us some history of the Franson farm and of your, you know, your dad's style of farrowing and, and raising pastured pigs. And then let's go into the history about the actual build and construction of these boxes. Oh, well, very good. Thank you, Megan. It's a lot of fun to be here. And, and uh, uh, we'll have a lot of fun this afternoon. My grandfather uh, and grandmother moved to Chickasaw County in 1912. And my dad was born in 1910. And uh, Grandpa Franz did not like raising pigs. And my dad said he wasn't very good at it. But my dad was uh, had different ideas. And so when dad and my mother got married in 1935, they moved to this farm. And they had uh, $80 to their name. So obviously they didn't have very much for money. And you aren't going to build any buildings in the middle of the Great Depression. But dad wanted to raise pigs and with very little money, what he did was he raised pigs out in the pasture, actually on this land we're standing on right now. My father would have used it for pasture farrowing going back to the 1930s. Um, over the years, that pasture farrowing would have developed over time, although dad basically had tin huts made with two by fours that you carried around by hand. He didn't even have a loader to move the huts and the water was hauled out here with horses, with a wagon and a barrel. You can imagine such a thing, but that's how they did it when you didn't have much for facilities. So that's when, I, as I grew up, I grew up to that and some changes in progress over time with how we had electric fence and a little better ways to water the pigs. I started farming in 1974 and what I'd first share with the practical farmer uh, viewers today is that what I was told when I started farming and uh, my dad uh, and I had to listen to this, people actually confronted us and said, you were insane to be investing in the hog business. Uh, my dad actually spent more money the first year that I farmed, they spent his entire life investing in swine facilities here because we needed to propel the farm where it was going to go forward and my dad knew he was building uh, an infrastructure that allowed me to buy the farm and pay him for it so what's good for the goose is good for the gander so in 1974 to expand our farrowing operations I built some huts that I want to call like a Quonset hut and they look a little bit like a uh, well they're just basically a curved uh, metal uh, hut with vertical sidewalls uh, it's hot when it's hot and it's cold when it's cold. I farrowed no a box we'll see over here, and then uh, to uh, a, a different version of a hut that we called an e-hut, and then to a bought plastic hut, and this last winter then, we have a newer style hut. So at any rate, pasture farrowing has been a stable here for a very long time, and uh, will continue to be, I think, well into the future. Okay, let's take the viewers along and go see these different huts. We'll start with the oldest one. Yes, we will. Okay, so we are headed to talk about this classic 
wooden A-frame hut. So Tom, yes. tell us what we're looking at. Yes, the huts we had before this were a Quonset hut that had a vertical sidewall and they were made out of metal. And the problem with the vertical sidewall is when the mother sow goes to lay down, she has a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of risk of her uh, laying on her pigs because uh, she has total access to them. The A huts became popular in the 1950s, 60s, and the 70s because your sidewalls are at an angle, which gives the little pig some protection on the edges of the building. So when the sow lays down, uh, your survivability is better. Our local lumberyard actually built these for me in 1990. So this hut is already uh, about 30 some years old. And, uh, but it works, but they're a little bit in the small side. But this is the general idea of an A hut. The sow enters to the center door in the front. There's a ventilation door in the back side, and the hut is built out of wood. It has good thermal protection, um, and it has fair uh, pig survivability. But they would serve the purpose that they served over time. Hey, Tom, before we move on to the next hut, you said you got this built in 1990. What did you or your father do prior to that? Well, the uh, Quonset huts that we had actually made, uh, made out of used material that was basically tin and two by fours. Okay. Not much different than the construction material my father would have had. Okay. But there was not really much idea behind what we could build that would really save little pigs. So and really it was just a rounded hut. A rounded hut is correct. Got it. Yes. Okay. All right, moving on. Okay. In the mid 1990s, uh, we came across a pasture hut design that came from a lumber yard in Illinois and uh, took a look at the design and made some improvements to it and actually built quite a few of these, probably built 35 of these. So this hut here was probably built in 1996, 1997, so about a quarter of a century old. And, and, and there's a good hut. It's, we call it an E hut because the idea was we at that time could take pictures and electronically share the pictures and the idea was to share information. And I think Megan has been a lot of practical farmer interest in this. Absolutely Tom, um, and we do have a question. Is this the only area, the only opening for ventilation? No, no, absolutely not. So let's go over this hut. Um, this hut has got a double pitch roof. So you have the water sheds off to the front, which actually helps in times of extremely wet. You have an access door over here that can be locked shut. You actually have the ability to put a uh, board inside of her. So if you want to lock little pigs inside, you can. And we come to the back side, it has a large tip out ventilation door. So this hut style has got some nice features because on a hot day like today, it's actually a very comfortable hut. And when it gets cold out, they just tip the door shut and the door locks down. So it has got good thermal protection. And because of the design of the sidewall here, it actually has fairly decent protection for small pigs. It's also a very safe house to be in. So if you want to load little pigs or sows from this house and you back a hog cart up to the door, you can enter from the backside over here. Or if you were processing pigs and had an angry sow to deal with, you could flee from this rear door. So the idea of the rear door makes the house with great ventilation, plus it's an extremely easy house to move. You drive by with a loader, the tine bucket's going underneath the roof, and it's built so strong that you pick the house up and you can carry it where you want to. So Tom, on a hot day like today, that's really sunny, even with the this flap open for ventilation, there's plenty of shade. There's plenty of shade. Yeah. And you don't have metal sides to basically make the building uncomfortable because of heat. Absolutely. So the thermal protection here. Now, if we go to the downsides of this, it's actually a fairly complicated hut to build. I'm not sure I can build one in a day's time. And it has a fair number of moving parts. And you might laugh at this, but believe me, over 25 years, a number of these huts I've had, maintaining the hinges of the screws on this door or the locking mechanism there is not funny. The plywood obviously deteriorates over time, but this plywood's a quarter of a century old. It's not too bad. It still functions. The front door does what it is but front door maintenance is really really common just from the door hinges and the door latches because the animal can get at it so it's a very good hut i'd say maintenance wise it's okay but it's pretty complicated and a lot of effort has been making been made to try to make this part of the hut very strong because the if there's anything comes apart it's the corner by the door and if you'll notice these are four by fours or four by sixes on this side so it's really 
feel strong to start with. In spite of that, if you look at my huts, you'll see a lot of them that that front door corner failed. Tom, we do have a question about, obviously these look a little too heavy to actually be able to like haul or slide but with a, with a person. So can you talk a little bit more about how you pick them up to move them on pasture? Okay, to move them on pasture is a loader with tines. Okay. The loader comes to the rear with tines and picks them up and we haul them very, very easily. We have used these huts inside in which there was times when we actually had a little carriage with wheels that you could put this hut inside and roll a hut around to throw in the wintertime indoors. Great. So a good hut, not bad, served its life over a long period of time, but fairly complicated build. Got it. Okay. All right. So all of the huts you pick up with a loader, right? Yes. And move that way. Yes, yep. the loader moves the huts. Dragging the huts will just damage the building. Got it. Yes. Um, Natural furrowing systems went to a very major study of survivability of pigs and after much work came out with a design of called a nesting box. And when this came out, we bought nine of these nesting boxes. Now the nesting box is designed to be used indoors. Um, we did use them for a while indoors and then I said, you know, we can take these things out in the pasture if we just put a roof on it. And so we have had excellent results with the nesting box in the pasture. So here we have an all almost entire plastic design. These boxes are probably 15 years old with almost zero maintenance. I, the maintenance on this thing is, is, is so minor, it probably amounts to a bend iron inside or a clip missing something on that. The plastic has been super. But the nesting box research showed that when they have this type of an interior design, the pig survivability is about the same thing as the farrowing crate. And the reason is that the sow does not have a, 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 an easy access to crush your pigs. And yet, the sow can turn around inside the box. So can we get a closer view of what's going on inside? So Tom, explain, explain what we're looking at here. Okay, so the interior of the box has got three very important features. The first is the tubular guardrails and they probably saved the lives of most of the pigs that would have been crushed otherwise. But the second is the plastic shelf on the sides that once again prevents somebody from getting laid on. A little pig in the basic area inside this box is really protected from its mother about 100%. A sow can lay on pigs once in a while I get it and the pig will be in the center of the hut. So it's not impossible in a pig, but people with farrowing crates will tell you sows lay on pigs in farrowing crates too. Right. So, but the survivability here is really important. The third thing that the nesting box has is a brooder area that's large near the rear of the box. And that brooder area is cool when it's hot and warm when it's cold. And the brooder area is very important. If you notice the access door in there, that's because if this was taken inside, that access door is where you put heat lamps. So you can put heat lamps in the rear of this box and have a heated brooded area at the same time. And meanwhile, for animal welfare, the sow has, has full ability to enter as she feels, turn around and lay down. So the nesting box has wonderful features. Tom, do you want to explain the, the tarp that can go over here as a feature? Yes. Yeah. So the issue was... Um, if they were, would you just stick with this? Well, the first, it's a very good question as a piece. Um, and uh, James and I discussed buying more of them, but then they weren't available. And our experience year in and year out, hot and cold has been excellent. A little harder to load out, a little more dangerous to load up because you don't have a rear exit. So this is not absolutely perfect, but it's the best thing I've seen in all the years I've ever passed a crowd. Mm -hmm. And it is the best because of the materials and the design and the dimensions, which are not of accident. Okay. So I'll be interested to know the cost comparison on this versus what you've now made. Yes, yes. But these, I believe, are about fourteen hundred dollars. Okay. But that includes a, a flat cover on here for a roof. But thank you, that doesn't work outside. So. Right. Okay. Well, let's move on to the newest invention from Tom okay. Franson. Well, last winter I needed to replace my what we call the E hut. <laughs> I needed to replace the E-huts because they're getting a quarter of a century old. And so the issue was what to build. <clears throat> and with the super features of the nesting box, I wondered to myself if we couldn't build a wooden structure that had the same dimensions. 
And so we uh, started with one design and built it and then improved and improved and improved. And this is design now that, that I'm very comfortable with. So if we step back, we take a look, we have the exact same length at the floor, the exact same width. We have the same height. We do have a sidewalls that are not vertical like that, but there's a reason for that. So our sidewalls here are at an angle. We have a single entrance in here like the box has. We have guardrails and a shelf. So we have all the critical features. Plus in the back end is the, is the pig brooder area. So all of those dimensions are within an inch of the nesting box. So we have the basic uh, set up the same. Then for a roof, similar to what we put on there, we have a cattle panel roof that's uh, attached over here with the fabric on top. These fabric are, are custom made for us. But this gives what I call a barrel effect. So in other words, if I want to make that panel even bigger and go with a longer tarp, we could have as high of an interior as we want to. So that allows, especially on a hot day, like as you can see, excellent airflow. And you can look inside the building and see very easily what's inside of there. So the other feature here that I think is, is very good, let's take a look at the number of moving parts. It's almost non-existent. Uh, there's nothing inside there. There's, there's two uh, guardrails, but they're basically permanent. And, and to put the door in, the door just sets in place like that. So we have almost no moving parts. The only moving part in the box is this, and the livestock don't have access to that. So, Tom, explain when you would use the door. If a sow had to be locked in, or she's having problems with her pigs. There are times when a door does get used. There are times when I use doors on the nesting box. But the great thing here is one door here would probably service six boxes. So again, it's a part of, of lowering cost. So then Tom, can you explain exactly why the rounded barrel here at the entrance? Okay. What we want is for the ability of the socks in the hut when they're small, so that the pigs will stay as a group with that mother sow for a long time. Um, that door design is actually very simple. It is a smooth core interior tile that is screwed down to a wood frame. Uh, we think the door design uh, uh, should stand up reasonably well, um, but this hasn't had a, a heck of a lot of use. But. Tom, do you think we should pick this up with a skid loader and try to yeah, look at it from another angle? Yeah, there are some other features angle? that we'll see in construction. So let's go ahead and, and we'll attach the house and take it up in the air. Very good idea, Megan. We'll also show you how easy it is to move the house. And this exactly. is the same principle that we use to move the other nesting boxes as well. Perfect. Are we getting a lot of questions? So with the hut up in there, you're able to see the construction details a little better. The front door is 5 8 inch plywood, and so is the rear door. And where we had maintenance difficulties with door frames, this door frame is two 2 by 4s thick here, which gives us 3.5 inches plus a half inch. A 4 inch thick door here. So that's very strong all the way around. And on top of all, 
the metal brackets that hold the guardrails are angle irons that are bolted to those two by fours. So the strength of the door, I, I don't think the door can be torn out of there. I think the house will be completely destroyed if you try to try to wreck the door because of the fact that it's so thoroughly secured. Tom, now that the hut's in the air, someone's asking how many pounds do you think this weighs? I would guess this weighs 500 pounds, four to 500 pounds, but that depends upon your construction design uh, or construction use of materials. Um, that's a very good question though. Uh, so, but it's heavy enough not to blow around in the wind, which is important. Lightweight huts are wind sensitive. Good heavy huts like this will not blow, even in fairly severe winds. So I'm gonna step inside here, and let's go through some designs. So the guardrails here really don't have an adjustment because I never adjust the guardrails in my nesting box. So they're basically put in here, and they'll stay in here. Next to it is a two by eight on each side, which serves as the shelf, just like what we had in the, in the natural furring systems. So our lower dimensions here are almost exa are exactly the same as the nesting box. On the rear, to get strong, is a two by six with plywood behind there to give our creep area for our little pigs on the inside. Again, exact same dimensions of the nesting box. The lower portion of it is treated wood, but our construction sidewalls here are important. There's a lot of options here on construction, Megan. So, okay. I want to know a few more of the unique features. Um, and I also am really curious about how much this co these cost you, Tom. Okay, well, let's talk about different design features. Now, on the outside, it looks like a metal hut, but that's because what we did is use used one inch thick wood to build the interior, and we covered the exterior with sheet metal, which gives us the durability of the painted sheet metal and the thermal protection of a wood interior. But that being said, this house could be built for a lot less money and built quicker if we discarded the wood siding and just had a metal sidewall. That's a lower cost, lower weight option. The other thing we could do is we could go to a thicker sidewall and have insulated sidewalls and make sidewalls far warmer, or we could insulate the top of the pig brooder area and put a plastic, uh, 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 the plastic strip door and create a cold weather hut really well. Now the roof, if you look up now, when I talk about that barrel, is that we have a lot of room for ventilation in here, but if we were in cold weather, that roof does not have to be that way at all. That is designed so a sheet of plywood could be insulated and used as an insulated lid. So Tom, the same person who asked how heavy these are, he, he keeps asking because he doesn't have a tractor to pick up a hut. And so it like, can you explain what would be, you started to get at this, what would be the lightest weight option? Could you put PVC piping on the bottom and somehow like rig this up to be able to pull with a yes. four-wheeler? Four Skids could be built that would adopt, allow this hut to be drug around. Stones, would cause you trouble because stones will damage something that's drug in the ground. If he does not have stones out there or rough terrain, these huts could be built with skids. And then of course, like replace some of the wood with metal and some of the wood up a bit. Right, right. So there's no patent here on design and it's an imitation of the nesting box, but the ability to change the sidewalls or the roof or to use different kinds of material would all have a big bearing on cost. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about cost. Tell me, you know, I know you built these in the middle of winter, which was during the pandemic, which construction materials are a lot more money now. What approximate cost for, for this building This is about these? $500 okay. in materials as January of 2021. Yep. And we're in an insane time right now in building materials, which I don't think you can even make a judgment call from. I mean, you're gonna quit building everything because stuff's high priced. Well, if it goes up, it usually goes straight down. But it's a $500 hut. But as bad as that sounds, that's about a third of the cost of a new nesting box with the same, the same characteristics. Exactly. And I argue more flexibility because you could build this lighter. I would also say that that plastic nesting box 
If that was drug around, it would probably be very hard on it. And yes, you could probably build skids to go underneath the plastic nesting box, but putting skids under this would not be very hard. So Tom, I take it that um, there's a reason why you have a white tarp for, yes. for sun reflection. Yes. Okay, would you change, like, it, how would you make this, if you wanted to winter farrow, you said you'd add insulation, potentially a lot of bedding, um, would you put a black tarp on the top? No, no, if I was going to winter farrow these on a regular basis, or use them for summer and winter, I would make it so that, no, this tarp comes off in a matter of minutes, but I would make it so you could detach the metal uh, uh, cattle panel frames. And then I, you would be able to set in place an insulated plywood cover. I see. Which would give you a warm roof and warm sidewalls. You can actually go thermally a long ways with this building. Awesome, Tom. Do you plan to use these in other seasons? We start farrowing here typically in, in May and farrow through October. But from October through May, we have an excellent indoor facility that meets all of the organic and the global animal partnership, partnership uh, requirements. Excellent. Well, Tom, are any last, any last like features to point out here while we're so close to it or else we could walk out to the pasture and see some sows? Well, it takes about a day to build a hut. These are almost entirely bolted together. There aren't even very many screws. They're just a, a, a heck of a lot of bolts. There are some screws. So the idea was to produce a low, uh, long-term uh, maintenance hut that's comfortable for the pigs and that meets the animal welfare. And I will say to the viewers out there that Tom is adamant to share these plans. So he has sent PFI his full list of construction materials, the blueprints that he drew out the step-by-step -step construction process instructions um, and a bunch of photos of him building them. And we can put that, we'll put that link to a blog where we house all of that information in this chat so you can access it. Okay, Tom, let's head, let's well, head out and see some of these in I use. would also have to add as well, you gotta remember, when people said 1974, there was no future in the swine. If I would've listened to that, none of this would be here. Well, we would have made a living. You know, the year after the person told me that, I bought a new Oliver tractor. Well, I'm glad you're st stubborn, Tom. Well, <laughs> I think it was more driven by gold than anything else because we wanted the diversity on our farm and we needed the income. And I was in my young 20s at that time. So uh, it, met, it fit, met really well with what we wanted to do. Here we have wire right here. Okay, so... Tom, tell us what we're looking at. There's about, what, six of these that you built over the winter? Right. And a couple of them are in use. Yes, yes, there, there are uh, boxes. Now you're gonna notice the plastic sides, and that's because what happened when we bought the nesting boxes, those are the original roofs, which sat inside of our storage shed for 15 years. And last winter I said, you know what, we can't use those for sidewalls. So we built as many huts as we could using the plastic sidewalls and the nesting box features. And the last one that we wanted to show was because other people would not have access to that kind of materials of one that can be built with local materials. Excellent. Well, let's, um, up there. we don't need to get too close, but let's try to look at um, a, a yeah. sow using one of these huts. Yeah, it's a hot June afternoon and we'll see how comfortable she is. And so, Tom, when is she due to farrow? Oh, she'll have pigs probably in July. And she's found a comfortable place. She's in the shade. She has got uh, wooden side walls for, to keep the temperature down. Perfectly comfortable. This box is a little different than the other ones because we were changing dimensions as we went. And, uh, uh, you know, but nonetheless, basically, it's the same. Okay, question about um, little piglets on pasture. How do you castrate on pasture? To process little pigs on pasture, I use a hog cart and I back the hog cart up to the building. And uh, if the sow is inside, I'll feed the sow in the hog cart and lock her inside and go inside the building. So if I'm in that building, the sow's locked in here, or if the sow is gone, I'll put the hog cart to the building, back up, chase little pigs into the hog cart, process them in the hog cart, put them back in the building. 
these buildings are a, a, a death trap. If you'd go inside there and get caught in the solid side, you would don't have an emergency access. The E huts have that great emergency rear access. So the that really couldn't be built into these huts. The absolute key is that you have to have a way to either lock up the sow or lock up the pig. Lock up the sow or safety. lock up the pig and process the pig. They're probably two to five days of age. Certainly not beyond a week. Thank you. Okay, I'm I'm curious, Tom. Do you have any last parting thoughts for our audience about pasture, you know, pasture farrowing, raising pigs on pasture, or specifically this this construction? Well, this construction should allow people with with uh, restricted resources to use use materials and build a farrowing hut, which gives good productivity conceivably year round, depending upon how far north you want to go with it. And driven by people who, as they come to their senses, realize that the food system needs to be decentralized and people need to be making a smart choice. So here's an animal out there and I think she's pretty happy. I looks like it. Yeah, from my view, this this animal looks extremely content. Oh, well, she's not panting or puffing. That's right, and it yeah, it's is hot out. it's hot out, and it's only going to get hotter. Yes. Okay, one one more question here. What's your pasture comprised of? Forage species. Um, we rotate our pastures, and we typically plant uh, red clover, a little alfalfa. Uh, and they'll disappear after a couple of years. Uh, this pasture here will go to corn next year, corn or hybrid rye, and so basically looking at the grasses that take the place once the clovers run out. What the sows will do is they love legumes and they're hard on them. Because you aren't gonna rotate in here, they eat the legumes down, and then you get dry wood like this, things just go dormant. Um, but still, come fall, uh, the sows to graze and utilize forage as well, and they'll eat all the grass that's out here. I might clip it, but they'll eat all the grass that's out here, and they eat all the legumes as well. How do you move the huts? Well, okay, so we talked about that. Tom lifts them with a skid loader. Yes. Um, how, how often do you move the huts? Okay, um, I farrow in the huts. So if I try to get sows to farrow as a group, uh, maybe six or eight, so a T to it that there is probably eight or ten huts in a pasture because have several of these pastures to farrow in. Yeah. But when sows are lactating or pigs are bigger, um, it's just whatever works out. I try to see to it though that a farrowing sow always has access to these huts. Excellent. And how do you wean? I wean at about six weeks of age and typically wean by restricting feed and then maybe feeding uh, the sows and pigs inside the huts and then trap them inside the huts. That would be a good example when you would use that door. So if the pigs are hungry, the pigs go inside there to eat. They'll put the door in, go back up with the, with the hot door and chase the wean pigs inside. So Tom, let's hit on that question from earlier while we were having the, the technical issue um, that was asked about what breeds you raise, and then what are some specific sow breeds that would not do well on pasture? We typically have a Chester White Duroc uh, a sow uh, that we buy as a gilt from uh, another farmer in the area that uh, uh, is a Nyman Ranch producer, um, and bred to a Berkshire or Berkshire Cross Boars. Um, our, our marketing program wants that. They, uh, they, but I do believe that the large whites are probably not well suited they certainly have not had any evolution to pasture because it would have been a 100% confinement animal. Where these animals over here have some evolution and adaptation to pasture. And I don't think that can be, you can't emphasize that too much. It's just like this sow is comfortable this afternoon, but this sow was totally uh, in a place where she had no sun exposure. You brought her here this afternoon, she would be massively stressed. So she came out here weeks ago when it was cooler, mm -hmm. and she'll adapt to higher temperatures. However, when they're farrowing, I go out here in the afternoon, and if it's extreme temperatures, I've got a watering thing on the four-wheel, and I drive by these huts, and I'll shoot water inside there on that sow and, and to, to keep them cool down in the afternoons, or they got a good wallow. In some places, I have very good wallows. So yeah, talk a little bit more about the access to water that they have in this pasture. Okay, um, it's a good thing you brought that up, Megan. If you can imagine my father out here, who didn't even have a tractor until after the Second World War, because he had to borrow his, his dad's tractor, couldn't buy one. 
And so he's out here with a team of horses and a cart and a barrel. And he would have pailed the water into the barrel, then pailed the water out of the barrel into a trough. You know, we wonder why they were, had uh, good muscles while they were using them all the time. So then when I grew up, we had a steel tank on steel wheels, which was leaking all the time. We pull it out here with an H farm wall, and then you pail the water out of the steel tank in the barrel with a pailing it. And then I went to waterers on hay racks, large plastic waterers. But then in the uh, early 1990s, we put an underground system in here that runs our well at home, and we have fountains out here. So our watering out here has been very good. It's only put in about two and a half feet deep. Uh, maintenance on it has been a little bit once in a while. It's almost 20 years of just a really good underground system that, that served us well, lowered labor cost, uh, uh, and it's just worked well. Excellent. A clarifying question about the weaning of the piglets. You had mentioned restricting feed. Is that restricting feed from the sows or the piglets? Both. Both. Yeah. Okay. I should tell a story about my dad's time, that one I remember really well. Uh, my father would have been uh, uh, in his 70s, out here one time, we were gonna wean some sows. And uh, he got knocked down, got the wind knocked out of him. I thought my dad, father was gonna die out here. And you know, it might've been two minutes without any air, or one minute or 20 seconds, I was scared to death. That's when I learned, you know, just restrict the feed. Absolutely. A couple of days later, they're all hungry and I throw a feed in the hog cart and they can pound a hog cart. I shut the door and dad stayed in town. He didn't argue with that. Well, Tom, I want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Well, it's fun. So incredibly valuable to pass down to the next generation. You are the keeper of a lot of knowledge in this with the system. So thank you. Well, it continues to evolve. It absolutely does. And for all the viewers out there, thank you for bearing with us and thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, yeah, we're happy to have matching hats. <laughs> we have matching hats. Yep. And we hope that you're now equipped to, to potentially build some of these on your own with the links that we provided you. Practical Farms will help you out. Absolutely. Um, we'd also really love to hear your feedback. Please follow the evaluation link that will be chatted in the chat. We, we take all of those very seriously so we can plan the best events for all of you. So that would be wonderful, thank you. And just a little bit left about Practical Farmers of Iowa in general, we believe farmers are the experts and we want other farmers to learn from farmers. So we put on events just like this and we really are placing emphasis on, on doing some virtual events and we'll continue to in the future because we know how important it is for you to be able to, to see and learn at any time that's convenient for you because we know you can't make it to all the field days. So stay tuned for in-person field days, which are going to start in July. We'll be sending out a guide about that. Um, and I also can't not thank all of the sponsors that make these possible for us and make them free and able to view freely. Um, so firstly, I wanna thank Riverside Feeds, which is owned and operated by James Franson's, Tom, Tom's uh, son. And that, feed, that organic feed mill is about 25 minutes from where we're standing right now. So thank you, James and Riverside Feeds. I wanna thank Nyman Ranch, and I wanna thank Johnson County Public Health for sponsoring. I also wanna say that we're doing these live from the farm events Tuesdays throughout this month and into July, throughout the summer. And next week, we're gonna be broadcasting live in Minnesota from Ben and Christy Dwyer's farm. And they're going to be talking to us about extending your crop rotation with clover. So until next time, so long from the farm. And hang in there. <laughs>